We had uh, just a couple of questions come in. First of all, Landon asks to Marin, uh, does increased phosphorus losses from cover crops include even with an overwintering species like cereal rye? So even cereal rye, does it lose those nutrients? Um, thanks for a great question. So we found that if this if the frost is severe enough, then yes. Um, and and um, I mean, certainly the there it depends on the species. So basically, anything that we treated with a significant frost released phosphorus. But um, at the same time, like I said, it it really so so I guess it's sort of both of these things. So um, yeah, like if you have a significant enough frost anything is going to release some phosphorus. But at the same time, if you look at the cereal rye compared to something like a frost, a tender or frost killed plant, like an oat or an oilseed radish, oil radish, they will lose a lot more than a cereal rye. So even if you're at risk of those frosts, cereal rye is gonna be a much better bet, but even it can release phosphorus, yeah, under those really, really significant frosts. All right, good to know, good to know. Um, I have a couple of questions personally. First of all, Amy, where can I get that Connections app and can it be used or adapted in other areas? I think that our Nebraska producers might be interested in such things. So we have two, uh, two programs available, right? Well, one is commercially available and the other one is really just a prototype. So the first one I mentioned is by the Del Delmarva Chicken Association. It's the litter app, L-I-T-T-R period. You can get that, download it from um, the Apple store or Android Google Play. It is only for our region. It's really the only place that it's being used right now. And then the second was our student entrepreneurial team put together a web clearing house that we're actually trying to figure out how we might work with other constituents to make that a reality because what we actually have is a minimum viable product but we had some ideas about expanding access to individuals who maybe aren't as tech savvy that would require some more significant investment in technology and programming skills far above what our undergraduate population has in, in Delaware. So I would be happy to talk with folks about potential opportunities. With that um, manure market that we developed, our idea was to have it be web-based too, so that we could use it as an educational clearinghouse in addition to a manure matching service. Because one of the things we are really concerned about are anytime you're working in animal operations, as soon as you bring third parties onto your operation, you need to be sure that they're following good biosecurity practices. And that's something I think that could be a real big problem if we're not careful about it. Plus, I think there's a lot of room, like I said, for education on the field staging and other BMPs for folks who are using and you know storing poultry litter. So my hope was to use that tool also as an educational clearinghouse as well as a matching service. Awesome. Thank you. Um, there's a question here also for Clark. How does the 4R certification process work for dealerships in Ohio? Yeah, um, it says NMPs are required for everyone here in Wisconsin, but any CCA or soil scientist can help advise folks for their, for their NMP. Yeah, and Ohio works in a lot in the same way. A producer, especially with the voluntary nutrient management plan, they do not have to use a 4R certified dealer uh, to develop their plan. They can even develop their own plan. Uh, Ohio State University has a kind of a spreadsheet um, application that producers can use. Uh, we don't differentiate between any of them as long as it meets state standards. Uh, we will approve that. The, the difference come in comes in in uh, uh, for, uh, through our Ohio Agribusiness Association, they have developed a 4R certification program for, for fertilizer dealers and crop consultants. Um, if someone has went through that training, then the, the avenue for getting this, the nutrient management plan approved is a little different. Uh, in our code, we have a director's designee, which is a, a state employee that works for our division. So 
if uh, plans are being written by the 4R certified dealers, they can submit them to our director's designees. And once the, the director's designee has reviewed, you know, several plans from an individual, and we understand they know what what they're looking what we're looking for, it makes just expedites that approval process versus having to have it approved by the local soil and water conservation district. So essentially, we've opened up two channels where uh, nutrient management plans can be approved uh, either by the local soil and water conservation conservation district, or it can be approved. Um, by a director's designee through a 4R certified dealer. All right, thank you. Um, I have one question, it's almost more of a comment for you. You said that 43% were signed up for the voluntary NMPs, and that number, that 43% didn't include those that had required CNMPs. So do you know what that total number is? It seems like you would have a pretty large majority uh, of acres covered if you included both the, the voluntary and the required CNMPs. Yeah, it, yeah we, we believe we have a, you know, a very significant per, percent, percentage of the acres in the Western Basin, especially in the Maumee watershed. Uh, the the, the um, Sandusky River watershed doesn't have a significant number of producers that rise to the level of needing a CNMP. They're, they're not permitted. We have a lot of livestock farmers that are below our permit levels uh, in, in both of these watersheds. So. So we hope we've got a large percentage of those involved as well. So we're still, as I said, we we haven't completed an entire year of verification for the, the first 14 counties and we've just closed sign up for the remaining 10 counties. So we hope by next summer, we'll have a much better handle on where our, our percentages actually are. Okay, 